All right, everyone. I'm GM Josh Friedel. I'll be going over uh, a strategic game. Um, so for this one, I chose actually one of my favorite strategic games. Uh, this was played in the Super Tournament of Lenares in 1991. Uh, White was Gatakomsky, uh, who's one of the top U.S. Grandmasters, uh, won the U.S. Championship many times, uh, against Anatoly Karpov, who was, of course, world champion. Not at that time, but he was in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so this was this was quite an interesting game. So let's get to it. D4, knight f6. Nimzo Indian. Knight f3. C5. E3. So this is, I'd say, not the most ambitious setup as white, but of course, it's perfectly, perfectly playable. Knight c6. Bishop d3. Bishop takes c3, pawn takes, d6. So this is actually quite typical for when this happens. Basically, that when black opts to give the doubled pawns, the idea is now to do what with your pawn structure? What do you guys think? What do, where do you think black's going to put the pawns? Exactly. So you put all the pawns on the dark squares. This might become a weakness, this pawn on c4 eventually, but not necessarily. Sometimes it's really not a weakness that is attackable. But the main thing is which piece of whites are you mainly hoping to lock down to make sure it's never a relevant force exactly if this bishop ever becomes active it can be very unpleasant because you don't have a bishop to counter so you have to make sure this bishop basically stays dead or at least as dead as possible so white played e4 so of course what kind of move is black going to be looking to play mm-hmm you want to make sure that your pawns get on the dark squares. If you allow white to put, get, get an e5 at the wrong moment, it could be very unpleasant. So white plays d5. In general, I would say when you have a structure like this, you're very happy to see the move d5. Do you guys know why that might be? Like, what is, does d5 open the position or does it close it? Close. Closes the position. Now, what piece combination likes to have a closed position, and which one likes to have an open position? What pieces like open positions? The two bishops. The two bishops. So if white plays d5, you're doing what to the position? You're closing it. Closing it. So that's probably bad for the bishops, right? This is not always true. I would say this is one of those things that's often overestimated. It's not so much whether the position is closed, but whether it's able to remain closed. If the position stays closed forever, almost always the bishops are quite bad in those kind of positions. The knights have plenty of time to hop around. Keep in mind, knights take longer to get places than bishops do. So close positions are slower. You have more time for the knights to get to where they need to go. But the key is that you don't allow breaks and don't allow the position to then open for the bishops. Um, but yeah, d5, usually happy to see. Like the kind of ideas that would worry me here, and I'm not saying even in this position they're best, but something like bishop here, not even saying this is a good move, but just the idea of like say castles, the knight maneuvering around to e3, keeping the tension, keeping things a little bit fluid. Those are the types of ideas you want to use when you're playing with bishops. Because bishops like fluid positions. They like positions where they have pathways. Like if, if you know, white would be jumping with joy, at least strategically, to see something like this, where now see how the bishops open. So almost always black's not going to oblige you, but this enables you to play like knight d2, maybe maneuver it around to e3. Again, I don't know if here that's necessarily best, but that's kind of the way white often likes to play. d5 is very committal, but it means that black can kind of do what they please with the knights. So white played h3. Black played h6. I think these are just kind of normal improving moves. I don't think they're anything special. Bishop to e3. Queen a5. Um, so I think queen a5 is just making sure black white stays tied down um, to the c3 pawn. So queen b3, queen c7. So there's actually a sneaky purpose for this. This maneuver looks really weird at, on the surface, right? But I would say that Karpov um, very rarely does anything without a purpose. Um, and it's kind of funny because I annotated this game a long, long time ago. Uh, this was a, an assignment I actually did 
uh, a homework assignment I did trying to annotate a strategic game. So, but I'm looking at my homework assignment and I can tell I didn't do a great job. <laughs> because I think I actually can see a clear purpose now to why I want the queen on b3 rather than d1. What move would black like to play with one of the knights? Exactly. And now knight h5 is a playable move. Exactly. So it's actually quite tactical. Karpov's a sneaky guy. But I, at the time, I was like, oh, moron. I wasn't really going like that. But I couldn't figure it out. So I don't know why. It's not that unobvious. I think I needed to do a better job with the homework. So knight d2. Indeed, knight h5 was played. Basically, and at this point, I'm correct, white, black really does not want to allow f4. And why do you think that would be? That's part of it. But f4 does what? Does it open the position? No. Really? Yeah, because now it's down. It does, right? And who does that favor? The bishops want it open, right? So f4 is the main idea. So black's saying, no, 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 no. You're not playing f4. If black can't play f4, it's going to be very difficult to open the position. So white tries g3. Black plays g5. At first, a move like this can look risky, but this is very standard in positions like this. Black is trying to completely lock down white's play, prevent, um, prevent f4 entirely. Because this knight is not exactly a stable piece, right? It's going to have to move eventually. So you're going to need some way to prevent f4. So I thought maybe white could try h4 immediately, maybe as an idea. But white decided to castle queenside. I don't know. It's kind of a debatable decision. But part of the idea is that because this pawn always hangs, castling kingside is going to be very difficult. Not to mention that black's probably going to play f5. So I don't think castling queenside is completely out of hand. So black plays knight g6, trying to lock things down even more. Bishop to e2. Knight back to f6. So this is kind of a funny moment. Tactically, black might be able to play this move. Kind of funny, right? Looks like a nice move. Why, why do you think he didn't play this? Maybe bishop g4. I mean, this is a check, but I don't know if that check actually leads anywhere. But I was even thinking you could drop back to f1. I don't know if bishop f1 is exactly the move you're looking for, but now it's kind of a problem because this knight is not, doesn't really have anywhere to go. Eventually, you're going to be able to threaten to take it with a move like f3. So Karpov's not lured into just putting his knight on f4 for no reason. He plays back. Note how he still keeps an eye on f4. This is very important. So Komsky tries to prepare it. Black plays queen e7. So the purpose of queen e7 is that um, you're able to clear space for, well, I actually don't want to give that part away. <laughs> um, but in this position, the queen tends to be more solid here. And also, if black ever, white ever tries to play with f4, you're better equipped to kind of deal with uh, these squares. They're all better defended. So white plays queen b1. And what do you guys think black goes for? How does black improve the position? Queen b1, incidentally, is so that if white tries to play f4, this pawn is defended. So it's all about like little maneuvering games. Which move? B4. This is b4? So g4, you have to be a little bit careful. Because g4, what are you doing to the position? And you have to be very careful with that, especially with your king here. So after pawn takes pawn, uh, what would your idea be? Um, the bishop takes. OK. But I think you experience problems here. What if I even just play f3? You have to go back, right? But you have to go back here, because you don't want to drop this pawn, right? Mm -hmm. And now this guy hangs. So you have to be very careful with moves like g4 unprovoked, because if you open the position, you open your lines for your opponent. 
I would say the tricky thing about playing these positions, and I'd say they really were well suited to Karpov. Um, do you guys know what Karpov was really known for? What style he had? Apart from being more on the strategic positional side, not that he couldn't attack. He was actually an excellent attacker. But what uh, style would you guys say he had? Those familiar? Yep. But one of the things he was known for was prophylaxis, which means basically he was really good at stopping his opponent's idea. There was actually a cool saying about Karpov, which was that the way you figured out what you were supposed to be doing in your position was by figuring out what moves Karpov was preventing. There were times when he would prevent opponent's ideas that the opponent did not see. And this kind of position, I think, is really good for him. And he did play this game excellently. And one of the reasons for that is because it's much more important in a position like this to prevent White's ideas than to carry out your own. That sounds kind of unfortunate, like, oh man, I want to do my own stuff. But the problem with a position like this is Black doesn't have any amazing ideas. There's no, all right, I do this, I accomplish this, and I get a great position, or I do this. It's more that if White can't do anything to you, your position is very good because you have a very solid structure. The position is very locked, which is not good for these bishops, as we discussed. And in the long term, white's king might be a little weird. These pawns are weak. So in the long term, your position is very good. But in the short term, you need to prevent white from doing things to you. So rather than having the mindset of, all right, what can I do? You have to always be thinking, what is my opponent trying to do? So rook g8 it might experience problems though after a move like h4, because this might hang. And that's the thing, after h4, you really want to be able to play g4 to keep the position locked. Um, so in this position, one of the important things is that I don't think white's threatening to play f4. So in the game, he played king d8. How many of you had this move on your radar? Now, this is actually, you would know this move if you played positions like this before, because it's actually a very typical move for these positions. Um, there's this particular low, um, Nimzo line after bishop b4, bishop to g5 immediately. And you get a similar structure to this. And in those lines, you play this idea all the time. And it's actually very simple. If you cancel king's side, what's the problem? What is white going to do to you? h4, and it's going to be ugly, right? You're not going to want any piece of that. Castling queen side is kind of tricky, because if you play bishop d7, this always hangs. And what's the problem with playing a move like b6? What idea does that invite in some positions? Exactly, the ray. That's what this guy, this guy is called, the ray. a4, a5, and all of a sudden you have a weakness. So you'd rather actually not put your pawn on b6 either. So what this move does is it gets your king out of the center, puts it on a very solid c7 square, and then you can develop your bishop. Looks weird, right? But these are the kind of ideas that in an open position, you could never do this. White would blast open the center, your king would be on d8, your opponent would be laughing at you, you'd be crying. Well, maybe not crying, but you'd be unhappy. But because the position is locked, because the center is so locked, you can afford ideas that are slower. You don't have to be in the same rush. But we have to make sure f4 doesn't work. So this was not played in the game. But what would you guys think to do after f4? How would you guys react to this? Mm -hmm. So queen e5 is possible, but uh, let me see. So I was actually, I was thinking here as white, you maybe could sack c3. Yeah, and then play queen c2. And the problem you have is you're, you're a little bit, maybe this isn't so bad, though. You take, you play knight here, you put your knight on e5, which is a really nice square. Maybe it's livable, but I'd be a little worried, because rook g7, maybe getting rid of this knight. You're really banking on this knight now. If this knight's not amazing, if this knight gets traded off, your king looks really bad, right? <laughs> I like your idea, but I'm not so sure it works out. Um, what I thought black might try here instead was actually just maneuvering the knight immediately. Notice how I'm always looking, what squares do I want my pieces on? And this square looks beautiful for a knight, right? So knight, but I like that you look at queen e5 first, because it's a tempo move. Very important, right? But knight d7 to e5, and I wasn't sure what black could really, white could really do here. 
Um, the main feature is that black's, white's king is just as bad as yours. So you don't have to really worry. It's not just, oh, my king is weak. Like, this king is also bad. So I don't know. This didn't look all that threatening. But knight d7, I think, might be an important move, trying to maneuver the knight's e5. I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty sure that that's why he didn't play this. He played a move I don't like. He played knight f3. I thought for sure he would play h4 here. And maybe Bai can play g4, but now there's h5, there's f3. White has at least chances to open up the position, which is what white wants to do, right? He played knight f3, which I didn't care for as much. So Karpov continues with his maneuverings, h4. But now I don't really like it, because black can keep the position closed. g4 with tempo, knight here. And uh, black finds kind of a nice idea now. Again, what is the main feature of these positions, right? The problem with a5 is you're thinking about what you want to do. Remember, the main focus is the opponent. Keep the opponent locked down. Do not allow them to do anything. Uh, does rook e8 prevent anything? I, remember, this hangs always. You got to be careful. Yeah. So guys, you forgot about this a couple times, so I'm going to just leave my mouse here. Sorry. Never forget about this pawn. Do not hang it. <laughs> Is that helpful? Trust me, we've, that, that's an easy pawn to hang, but you've got to keep in track of all your pieces, right? Can you push the pawn forward? You can, but this move, I think, black, white has a very nasty move now. Do you like this pin? I don't like it either. Probably you just lose. That's how nasty this pin is. I'm going to play f3 next, open up my rook. Ah. Got to be very careful about what squares you allow. Played this one. So how does this stop f3? Exactly. So this is what the thing I've noticed. Like When people are playing positionally, they forget that you can use tactics for positional means. Um, this isn't really a tactic. It's just you're attacking a different pawn. But it's basically you're, you're preventing something indirectly. Rather than directly trying to combat this move, you're trying to attack something else and combat it that way. So you want to remember that you can use tactics in your favor. In this game, this was a very positional game, but he used tactics a lot. And you'll find that the really great positional players, this is what they do. They, they're good at tactics. They use them to help improve their position, to make their position better. So knight h5 is kind of an example. Also, I want to add, do you like this knight? I don't like this knight. It's kind of in the way. Eventually, you want to play f5, right? So this knight is not really a great piece anyway. So I like to move it. So white played queen c2. So now what? It's a little bit sad. So black further improves. Another sneaky move, I would say. Bishop d7 is kind of what I expected. But he played queen e8. So again, the idea is it's kind of a sneaky move. If white allows, the queen can slingshot over here. Bishop d7 sometimes is an annoying move. And then if queen d1, you even have bishop a4 if you need it. Um, and he also leaves squares for his other pieces. So I don't know. It's kind of a cleverish move. White played bishop d3. So white wants to prevent f5 now. Black plays here, white plays here. So what to do? Queen f8, range of one. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with moving a piece twice like this. Keep in mind, this position is very closed, meaning it's very slow. Um, you, moving a piece back and forth, changing up your plans. Keep in mind, the white queen is not really great here apart from attacking this pawn. Black doesn't mind moving the queen again. Um, so making sure you're not in a rush is of real importance. If you try to rush a position like this, it'll often just mean you, your position becomes bad. That's usually all it means. You've got to take your time and only rush when your opponent's threatening really serious stuff that you've got to prevent. So white played knight c2. Queen g7 is interesting with the idea of rook to f8. Trying to think, there, there was a, I mean, he played this, but there was some other idea I liked. 
Ah, but Queen G7 has an added bonus too, that in some of these positions, this pawn can hang if you try to mess with this side of the board too much. So Queen G7 actually has some clever points. So King B2 was played. Rook F8, so very nice. F5 now is kind of hard to prevent, right? So he plays here. So F5. Do you guys want to play F5 or no? That's more like it. Where are we in a rush? No. We're taking our time. So he doesn't want to allow a knight to b5 at all. So he's like, no, no, no. Sorry. Next time. King to a1. So time for f5. Why not? What is white's idea? If you could give white two moves in a row, what would they be? Remember, we're mostly, even though we're playing black, we're mostly thinking of white's moves, right? Because we're thinking of what to prevent. What does white want to do here? If you play queen b2, rook b1, that's going to be pretty ugly, right? Queen coming into b6. So you have to make sure, whatever your move choice is, that you do not allow that. So if you play f5, you have to make sure that you can stop rook b1, queen b2 in time. And if you can't, what is more important, getting in f5 or preventing white's idea? Pretty much the answer to that question every single time is preventing white's idea. So what's his idea? How do you? Penetrate b6 now? The answer is very simple. You don't, right? b6 is too well guarded, and this pawn is actually hard to attack because this stupid knight's in the way. Otherwise, this might be a weakness, but because this knight's here, it's actually very difficult to attack this pawn. Kind of funny, huh? So, white plays rook b3. White still wants to gang up on that pawn. So, what does black do? He finds another way. Ah, and this is the sneaky thing. He's not threatening it yet. So he plays queen g6 with what idea? Very simple. What's the break you want to play for? So queen g6 prepares f5. Keep in mind, if you had played rook b7, rook b1 with the idea of this, this pawn's always hanging, right? So that's not an ideal solution. What he does is he puts the knight on c8. So you guys might be asking, which is not a bad question, like, why do you want to put a knight on c8? Like, isn't that a terrible piece? But what do you think the answer is? What would be the counter-argument to the knight on c8? Everything's defended. That's your main goal, right? And it's a slow position. This is not a position where putting one piece on a bad square, it's going to be hard to have all your pieces on good squares. It's just one of those positions. So also notice, if these guys can't take here, they're not actually that great, right? If they're not careful, even bishop a4 threatening to win an exchange might be a move. I don't even know if you want to take that exchange. I, this is the other thing. When you have a completely locked position, Sometimes rooks are not as valuable as minor pieces because there are no open lines, right? Now, this is not always true. I'm not saying just give away your rooks willy-nilly every time you have a closed position. But sometimes giving up an exchange, even in open positions, as we know, an exchange sack can be a powerful tool. But I'd say in closed positions, rooks tend to mean a little bit less. So bishop a4 may not even be a good idea. But it, in any case, Komsky didn't really want to allow it. So he played here. So what now? He likes to prepare his moves very well. <laughs> but keep in mind, is white ever going to prevent f5? Is f5 ever not happening? 
There's no way to stop it, right? So why should he play it too fast? It doesn't win the game, right? It's just a breakthrough. So he does this, and what this does for him is now when he plays f5, he has the option after bishop takes to maybe take with the knight. Maybe that's a good option, right? So if you can learn anything from this kind of position, it's really just do not be in a rush. Almost always, doing things the slow way can be better. Again, the exception is if your opponent can actually counter something or threaten you really badly. So Komsky's like, all right, come on, man. Play it, make a weakness. So Karpov's like, all right, I'll give you one weakness. It's the one concession he makes all game. Have a5. So Komsky does a little dance. He's like, yes, finally I have a weakness to work with. He goes back. Sometimes that's all of what positional maneuvering is. You're just trying to provoke one weakness. But look how many moves he had to play to provoke this weakness. And notice he completely abandoned this side of the board, right? So now, hello, finally got an f5, huh? So it takes, takes. Convenient that you can take with the knight, though, right? Which he does. Bishop back to d2. Rook to f8. Looks like black's making steady progress, right? Knight a3, uh-oh. The weakness is coming back to haunt you. So how does he deal with this? He plays this one. Knight a7 looks a little funny because now this guy is weak, right? So if I play queen b2, you have to go back, oh, yeah. right? But rook b7, and the thing is, you created a weakness. But there are times when one weakness is just not enough. This is a weak square, but what does the knight on b5 do exactly? He played back, because if he plays check, the king nicely slides here, convenient move, right? What's the problem? Sometimes knights, people overestimate, at least in my finding, knights on outposts. They look really pretty. But you always have to ask yourself, what is that knight doing and attacking? It's attacking this pawn, which is defended like 20 times. That's good. What else is it doing? Nothing, right? So it's important not to be terrified of knights on outposts all the time. There are times when a knight on an outpost hits all the important squares, attacks half your pawns, then OK, worry about it, right? But there are times when one knight on an outpost eh, can deal with it. So white plays back. Karpo plays rook f6. He might want to move his queen one day, and he needs this guy defended. Queen to d1. King d8. What could be his idea? That's part of it. But his idea is actually much more longer term. Very nice. I know you were half joking. But I could tell you were also half serious, and that's what counts. No, this is the thing. The king here, it's hard to make progress with the king here, because if you try to move your pieces out, your king's kind of open, right? The queen might come into here. That just looks annoying. But say your king's over here, your rook comes here. All you have is one passive piece, a knight on c8. That's a small price to pay to restrict this rook, this rook, all these pieces, right? Think about it. It's actually, rather than having a passive knight, think about it this way. It's, a pa it's, it's one passive knight against two passive rooks. I'll take that trade any day. So he wanders over. Wander, wander. Do you want to wander again? Why does he play this move? What would happen if he just kept going? Whoops. So, so make sure. Remember, his mind is always on Blight's play, more than his. Knight t7. Should be three. Rook f3. Rook f6. You might ask, what the heck is he doing? The answer, of course, is he's not in a hurry. He's just probing. He's seeing what White's doing. So he puts his queen in the center. Queens like to be in the center, as we know. Rook c7. Knight here. So what has he accomplished? Apart from making white play the very depressing bishop c1. Where is he headed now? 
Yes, he can. Headed to the king side. And again, once his king's over here, he can be a little bit riskier because he's not getting mated over here if he lets white crash through. So eventually he can try to do something. He slides over. Knight g7. He doesn't want to get his queen trapped by some miracle. Um, but I'd imagine also, if you play king g7, what do you allow? Let's say he were to do this. Yeah. Maybe this isn't a big deal, but why bother, right? Remember, always ask, is it necessary to allow this move? Probably not. So he goes back. This knight wasn't doing a whole lot anyway. Knight back to e1. King g8. Rook f7. He's slowly accomplishing his ideas. But slowly is OK. What has white done, right? Queen c6. Uh-oh. So how do you deal with queen c6? Yeah. No big deal. It's all covered. This guy hangs too, by the way. So he plays queen back. Knight back to f5. Notice there's a lot of back and forth. This is pretty normal in closed positions. A lot of the times you have to go backwards, go forwards again, and it's all about making small gains. But notice how white's position now, remember how this pawn was not even remotely close to a weakness before? It's getting there, right? That's an annoying pawn to have to defend. This bishop, we were restricting it. Now it's looking like a downright bad piece. So slowly we're making progress. Notice how the king here looks a lot nicer than the king here. The king here would not feel so great about itself, right? King here, perfectly comfortable. So bishop goes back. Rook to f7. Knight to d3. King to g7. Where is he going now? What's his idea of this move? What piece might he want to move now? Like if, if, black could improve, if black could move one of the pieces, which piece do you think is in the way? Right, but what's the problem if he moves it? You forgot the friendly cursor. I forgot to leave it there. <laughs> this pawn hangs. So he's just defending his pawn. Now he can move his knight again. Now, he could calculate lines where you, he allows bishop takes h6 and he goes for some sacrifice. Do you think he did that? Why not? Just take his time? Yeah. He is a patient man. How long, what was the time control system? Way too long. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm actually not sure, but back then the time controls were longer. It was like... I think it was, I don't, I don't think this was a period where they did, um, they used to do uh, sealed moves and uh, adjournments. Do you guys know what those are? No. So basically, when you reach time control, you would actually seal, write down a move, seal it, and then, uh, and then the next day, you would play that move and play it out the next morning before the next round. Now, of course, they don't do that. They have sudden death. Um, but even this, but this tournament was a while ago, so I'd say they maybe didn't have adjournment, but they had, you know, multiple time controls. So it was probably 40 moves for two hours, 20 moves for one hour, 20 moves for one hour. So this could have last. This could have been like eight hours of torture for Komsky. <laughs> I guarantee you, K K Karpov was enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> Komsky was not. And the thing is, Komsky is an excellent positional player. It's one of the things he's known for. Um, but. In this game, he was on the wrong side of the action. So knight back to e1. Rook to f6. So I mean, even here, you have to ask, why isn't he just going back? And I'm not sure I can even tell you on this one. Let's see if we can find it. Sometimes you, know, you ask yourself to put yourself in their shoes, and you're like, maybe he's just not in a rush. Bishop e3 is coming anyway. And then you can't break through. So I don't know. Probably he was just dilly-dallying. He's like, eh, I'll take my time. And sure enough, actually, white kind of made this, chose a poor decision here. Queen b5 was probably best, kind of keeping the game as is. And I still think it's very bad, but black has to find a way to break through. 
But this was actually a really cool moment because it shows the effectiveness of playing this way. Uh, one of the things that Karpov would do to opponents, and he did it here, even to a, a very, Kamsky, by the way, is an amazing defender, extremely good defender. But what happens is it's not just the position that makes people make mistakes. What else do you think contributes? Mm -hmm. You get tired, you get low on time. Now, Komsky, as well as anyone, was good at standing up to all these pressures, but no one can withstand up pressure indefinitely. If you have a bad position and you're just suffering, the longer your opponent makes you play this, the more likely you are to make a mistake. So sometimes you don't want to rush it, not because your position, not because you don't have a good idea, but because your ideas aren't going anywhere. And the longer you make it last, sometimes the more likely it is your opponent will just hand you the game without you having to create it, take any risk, without you having to do anything too special. It happens a lot. And I'd say the lower rated you go, the less experienced you go, the more prone that is. Say for, for someone even of my level, right? If I'm playing someone rated 300 points below me, it's very likely I'm gonna do this and they're more likely to crack, right? If I'm playing another GM, I still might do this, but they at least have some chances. Um, but I'd say that very few people can withstand it indefinitely. So if you keep putting them under pressure, you keep making them find good moves, eventually they'll probably find a bad move. And in this case, Komsky played this, which is not a good move. Because he goes back, and now there's a problem. What is the problem? On f2 and on c4. And uh, two pawns are hard to defend at once. So he played knight d3, decided to have a snack. And this is the thing. Maybe Komsky saw this and just had enough. He was like, you know what? I'm going to do this and change the position. But unfortunately for him, it doesn't change it enough in his favor. He plays an interesting idea. He takes on e5 and plays here. So it looks like he's changing the position, right? He's making the game a little more open. The bishop looks a little nicer. You know, maybe things are becoming complicated. So how you guys are, from Karpov's point of view, how do you restrict white's play? How do you keep white at bay? What do you do here? Doesn't have to be fancy. Just keep everything defended. If you allow white to take this pawn, it might be annoying because then you have weaknesses, right? If you allow white to take this pawn or get the pieces in, it could be bad. So just keep white at bay. Do not allow white to penetrate your position. And of course, you have to deal with the very basic threat. Pawn takes knight, right? Is a big threat. So your move should address this in some way. played rook f7. Queen f7 is possible, I'm sure. Um, pawn takes knight. Knight takes pawn. Ah, but this pawn hangs. Yeah. So the queen, you have to make sure you keep an eye on all your weaknesses. That's the problem with having a pawn like this. Sometimes it can become a weakness. But rook f7, you don't really need to guard the first rank. So he does this. Queen goes back. Rook goes to e6. So again, he's just trying to make, keep his position solid. Puts the pawn on e4. Um, so yes, the position has changed, but white also has lost a pawn. And I'd say it's a significant pawn, because now this is still a weakness, this is still a weakness. The key is just to keep this king safe. Rook d2, so white wants to get counterplay. Does white black take this pawn? No, he doesn't. Bishop b2, yeah. yeah. The funny thing is, sometimes taking a pawn like this is bad anyway, just because it activates the bishop. Sometimes pawns like this, the bishop actually hates because it blocks all their play. So instead he plays knight c6. Where do you think he's headed? And then? Yeah, this is a very tasty square. It's going to be very unfortunate when he lands there. Well, yeah. so of course, Komsky doesn't want to allow that. So what now? What's the idea? Tacking a pawn, although you can't actually take it just yet. So what other ideas does this have? Where else can this rook go? Potentially. You know, rook d3, that can be an annoying cutoff move. 
Um, if a piece blocks here, then the knight can land here. So white gave a check. Black went back. White went here. But now, of course, so this is the other funny part. You get to this position, and the key now is the king actually changes its course again. Plays king e8, knight e5. So what now? What's the king in the game? I mean, queen in the game. Mm -hmm. So this is Komsky's trick. Do you want to take that rook? No. Queen d7 check would be unfortunate. Imagine working all the way to this position and missing queen d7 check. It would be quite a shame. But luckily, that knight on d3 is probably worth the rook anyway. Keep it simple. Don't allow any play. What's hanging? Or the pawn. On b6, right? Yeah. No big deal. All covered. So Komsky goes back. Rook d6. Keep the d5. Keep it so the knight can move. Queen c2. A4. I love these moves. It's such a it's such a Karpov move. Just in case you want to go to b3, no. a3 is not a move he wanted to play, I can guarantee you. But he saw knight b4 was often in the air. Not immediately, because this is checked, but knight b4 is sometimes available. a3 probably is not such a big deal. But he's just running out of moves. So how to continue now? You have white totally paralyzed. You eventually want to bring some pieces in. There's one piece that's kind of annoying you, though. Ah, eh, bishop's not so great. You'd like to be able to maybe even move the knight and move a rook or do something, but what's, what's going to hang? And we all know Karpov's never in a rush. Keep in mind, he built his position to here. It's not going anywhere. So how does he make progress now? Because I think this is, again, what separates him. Like, so many people would have, like, their mouths would be watering here. They want to crush white really fast. But he is not in any rush whatsoever. He knows his advantage isn't going anywhere. But there's one piece that's annoying him, this stupid rook. So what to do? Queen d4. Queen d5? Uh, queen d5. Possible. But I like my queen here. I don't know about you. Keep in mind, this is check as well. Yeah. Leave your queen on the, this is the other thing. When you're looking for pieces to improve, don't start with ones that are already excellent. This queen on c4 is a beautiful piece. This knight on d3, beautiful piece. Do not adjust them. Start with pieces that aren't as good. This king was a little weird here anyway. This was check, this was check. Why would you deal with that, right? And now he's just gonna kick this rook. See you later. And now he can play what? Obviously, you got to see this move. You don't want to drop this pawn. But his idea here was to do what? Push the b pawn? Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, white has more things to worry about. b4, at some point, could be a really nasty move. So you see how he's just slowly improving. Even here, he's not in any rush whatsoever. Um, and it just, it makes it impossible to play. Like, what can white do? You guys know yourself, right? If you have something clear you can do, some clear improvement to your position, you just play the move. If you don't have any clear improvements, if you just have to sit there, it's much harder to do nothing than to do something. Um, and in this position, I think, though, it's not a question of Komsky's resistance. It's just an impossible position. So he plays rook g7, going after the pawn. So what now? He probably didn't want to retreat. Um, 
And the main reason, maybe this is a little weaker now. Maybe this, I mean, you also have to worry about bishop f4 then. Um, he calculated here. And that's the thing. Eventually, you come to a point where, OK, you should calculate some lines, right? It's, it's, it's very rare the whole game you can just go without calculating. But he did have an idea. He played b4, trying to push through. And I'm sure this is a movie spent time on. So first of all, what is his idea on queen takes a4? Well, yeah, because otherwise, I mean, you're threatening mate. Do you think Karpov just missed it? Probably not. He was a pretty strong guy. What was his idea? Well, queen c3 checks pretty obvious. The question is, how do you deliver the final blow here? That's clever. Maybe this works. It's not what I saw. Maybe rook takes b3? I don't know. What I found was, was this move. I think it's more clear cut. You have to take it, right? Knight c1. And now you have to give away all your pieces. Pretty straightforward, right? So that's the thing. Like, even I don't care how positional the game is. And you saw the whole game, he avoided any complications. He kept counterplay to a minimum. Almost always, especially if you're playing a strong player. But even if you're playing someone who's weaker than yourself, who, who is, you feel like is collapsing, Almost always, there'll be one tactical moment at least. A moment where you have to find a tactic and you have to finish the game in a tactical way. If you don't play b4 here, it's a little inconvenient, right? Defending this pawn's a little annoying. You'd have to move back, maybe allow this. But your pieces are so good, you're ready to play b4. And, you and I can guarantee you, he saw b4 way in advance. It wasn't just here he saw b4. But it's important that you don't forget about tactics. Even if you're playing slowly, even if you're taking your time, if you see that tactical knockout, you go for it. So Komsky played this move instead, and now, of course, the super ugly move. I shouldn't say ugly for black, but basically, when a pawn gets here, you guys can just safely resign. That's usually the rule. Uh, it's just bad. So queen e2, knight e5, using a few tactics, right? You can't take this queen. Queen e1. And then the final tactical blow. Finish them off. Very nice. So what's the idea of queen takes d6? Yeah. Pretty, pretty nice. So Komsky played check. Checked a bunch. But after queen c1, I think he just resigned himself. Like, I think he played queen c1 and resigned. Because he saw queen a2, and it was probably too depressing. Anyway, you don't often see a player of this strength lose like this, um, like without creating any counterplay all game. But it really just speaks to, I mean, how good, I mean, because Komsky's good at closed positions. This speaks to really how good Kamp, uh, Karpov is at him. But also, you can learn a lot from games like this. If, if anything, like, learn how he took his time. He was never in a rush. He only had to calculate some tactics at the very end, which, of course, he usually does very precisely. Uh, it's what he's known for. But, um, so you have to calculate tactics at the end. But the main emphasis on all these positions was preventing opponent's play before you even think about your own. It was only when everything was prevented did he do stuff. Only when nothing was happening on the, on the queen side did he play f5. Only when he had everything under control did he play b5, b4. Um, and not every position should you should you think like that, but in in certain types of positions, if you can kind of adapt that kind of thinking, it can be uh, it can be very nice. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the game.